to introduce uh, Darren Byler uh, to join us. Darren is an anthropologist, uh, fairly recently appointed as assistant professor of international studies at Simon Fraser University, that's in Vancouver in Canada. Uh, and Darren has just published not one, but two books, both dealing with the impact of government policies in Xinjiang. Uh, the first is titled In the Camps, China's High-Tech Penal Colony, and that one is aimed at a, a wider readership. And the second, which is his more academic uh, production, is an ethnographic monograph titled Terror Capitalism, Uyghur Dispossession and Masculinity in a Chinese City. And that is just out with Duke University Press 2022. Uh, and I think that will be the focus of today's talk. So I'm especially happy to be welcoming Darren to our um, series today. Uh, I've been following Darren's work for several years now. Um, Darren did his field work in Urumqi, that is the capital city of Xinjiang, in the years immediately preceding the opening of the huge system of internment camps, which swallowed up um, over one and a half million Uyghurs, Kazakhs and other peoples. Um, perhaps more than anyone else working on this issue, I think that Darren's writing really exposes the human cost of Chinese policies in Xinjiang. And I have to say personally, that Darren has become something of a moral compass for me. Whenever over the past few years, I've become exhausted by the polarized arguments around this crisis, the claims and the counterclaims, um, a new piece of writing from Darren has popped up uh, and it has reminded me of the need to keep engaging with the human suffering that's still going on. So I've just finished reading Terror Capitalism. I think it's a really powerful book. It's um, intellectually and emotionally engaging. Uh, it lays out a clearly argued and I think very persuasive theoretical and political frame, which situates Uyghur enclosure and dispossession as forms of settler colonialism and as a frontier of global capitalism. Uh, and what I also really like about this is that the analysis derives directly from the ethnographic encounter. It builds on the experience and the perspectives of individuals, uh, both Uyghur and Han Chinese, people who were Darren's friends in Urumqi, uh, most of whom, of course, have since disappeared. Ah, so without taking up any more of our, our precious time, I will hand over to Darren. The floor is yours. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's a it's a real honor to be here, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, yeah, just just doing what I can um, to stay engaged with this um, and the solidarity we've built. I think as researchers has been a, an a, an important part of that project. What I'll do in my talk today is. Um, go through a, a recent piece that I'm, I'm publishing soon through Anthropology Now um, that looks at the, the life of the brother of, of Mahmoud, who's the, the main character of, or one of the main characters, um, you know, figures that I write about in chapter three of Terror Capitalism. Um, so in the book, I refer to this young man um, so in passing, um, but I wanna tell his story now because his story sort of, brings us up into the present in some ways and also helps me to reflect on some of the, the key themes and ideas that I'm talking about in the book. So I'll, I'll talk about this young man who I call Iskandra, um, going through his story and then that will lead me into a discussion of, of the central frame of the book, terror capitalism. What is it? I'll try to explain it by um, giving, a, giving it a bit of nuance, um, looking at it from a, a few different vantage points. Um, and I'll end the talk by um, thinking about a, a frame and, and, and term that I develop in the book called subtraction, um, which is the, the subject of the final chapter of the book, um, just as a way of sort of thinking through how accumulation has been generated in this space. Okay, since 2017, hundreds of thousands 
maybe as many as a million and a half, Uyghur and Kazakh people in Northwest China have been detained due to past Islamic activity and political behavior that was later deemed illegal. In a, document, in a document submitted to the UN, Chinese authorities described these detainees as civilians whose extremist or terrorist activity was, quote, not serious, or whose malicious intent was not deep, and who were able to express repentance. Over time, a process of transforming these detainees emerged. More than 533,000 civilians, many of whom were first held in the camps, were formally prosecuted. They were slotted for actual imprisonment rather than factory work. Thousands more were transferred from the camps, known formally as closed concentrated education training centers to factory complexes that were built in the Uyghur region over the past decade. These industrial parks were often built by companies and government agencies from more affluent parts of the country, such as Shenzhen or Shanghai. This system produced a re-education labor regime that mimics aspects of the migrant worker system in Eastern China, but it now incorporates a $100 billion investment in surveillance and infrastructure to make worker movement even more highly controlled than migrant workers elsewhere in the country. You know, it's using this technology and also a legal system um, to exclude Uyghurs and Kazakhs and place them in this particular uh, work environment. By mid-2018, the Regional Development Authority declared that the camp factory mechanism had become a carrier of the regional economy, attracting companies from across the country. They placed it at a similar level to older extractive industries such as oil, natural gas, and corporate farming. This labor regime produced a new category of worker, which I contend is best captured by the phrase terrorist worker. This odd phrase, the terrorist worker, is the result of logics of data valence, which is a kind of surveillance that uses data analytics to look for patterns in data. Um, and legal frames of exclusion. Um, together, they build a novel frontier of global capital that I call terror capitalism. I met a young man who I'll refer to as Iskander for the first time in 2015, when I traveled to his home village with his younger brother, Mahmoud. I was the first foreigner Iskander had met. He was excited to talk to me about life in another world. He had short cropped hair. Unlike many other young men in the village, he didn't have a mustache. He had shaved it in order not to be perceived as a young man who was too attached to Uyghur masculine traditions and Islamic practice. He had dropped out of middle school to help his father farm full time. Now he was preparing to get married and eventually he thought he would inherit his father's land and follow in his footsteps, raising sheep, cultivating grain in the shadow of the snow-capped Tianshan Mountains. It was a hard life, but it was all he knew and he was good at it. In early 2018, a new party secretary was appointed in Iskander's prefecture. In his first public proclamation, the new secretary, a recently arrived Han official who came as part of the Aid Xinjiang campaign from Eastern China, uh, reaffirmed that in accordance with the anti-terrorism laws that had been enacted the previous year, um, a zero tolerance policy regarding Islamic behavior would be strictly in enforced. Individuals older than 12 were required to confess and repent if they had taken part in any extremist activities. Those that confess would be treated with leniency, he promised. The newly illegal activities were laid out in widely circulated lists of 75 signs of extremism. The manifestations ranged from, quote, preventing the circulation of normal commodities on the grounds that they are not halal, to, quote, attacking development and management measures, such as the aid Xinjiang system, which was responsible for mo the monitored and assigned labor programs. Protests against the West East oil and natural gas pipeline and infrastructure program that drove the extraction economy was also a sign of religious extremism or terrorism. Cam complaining about the rural household registration and associated passbook systems, which prevented freedom of movement outside of uh, Uyghur's home counties was also a sign of extremism. 
Number 48 on the list, outlawed gathering in prayer rooms and disturbing the public order. Number 53, deemed international money transfers by Muslims a sign of terrorism activities. And sort of regardless of, of what was actually being sent and who it was being sent to, if it was, if it was being sent by Uyghurs, um, particularly to people in Muslim majority countries, it was a sign of terrorism. Numbers 67 through 73 outlined using virtual private networks or VPNs, data sharing devices, WeChat, and other social media to discuss religious topics, something that literally millions of Uyghurs were doing prior to them being deemed abnormal. And I refer you to um, uh, an article written by, by Rachel and Aziz and also her book um, where she talks about Islam through smartphones, uh, something that was widespread prior to this campaign. Uh, at first, very few people in Iskander's village confessed to past abnormal behavior. They had already seen many people arbitrarily detained since the war on terror began in 2014. But then the local police began to scan people's smartphones, looking for more than 50,000 specific markers of Islamic activity that fit the list of 75 signs. Service to more than 100,000 people's phones were stopped and they were detained for questioning. Eventually, the scans determined that 1,869,310 residents of the region had used a now illegal file sharing app similar to Airdrop called Zapia, uh, which uh, functions outside the Chinese internet and therefore cannot be controlled. Traces of banned digital files were found on the phone of one of Iskander's friends through these scans. During his interrogation, he confessed that years before, he, Iskender, and others in the neighborhood had studied the Quran and prayed together in a prayer room outside of the mosque. Later that evening, the police officer from their village, a former middle school classmate, came to Iskender's home. He had a pained expression on his face. He urged Iskender to confess. The officer said that regardless of whether Iskender confessed or not, he would be detained. He implied that Iskander would be protected if he confessed. Iskander would need to undergo a period of political education, he said. And by this point, you know, political education in the work brigade headquarters was a normal aspect of life, so it didn't sound too bad. Iskander had known the officer his whole life. He trusted him. The officer followed standard operating procedure. <clears throat> There was a five-step process involved in receiving a voluntary surrender. The officer was to accurately categorize the potential detainee. Then he was to run the image on the detainee's ID through the centralized face recognition database, strictly evaluate the evidence that was presented in the system by questioning the detainee, verify the detainee's household registration status, looking for connections to other untrustworthy people. And finally, he was to complete a standardized digital file for the individual. As Iskander entered this digitization intake process, he was placed in a new category within the digital enclosure system, which is the, the subject of the first chapter of my book. His relationship with the, the police officer, his past political work no longer mattered. In the system, he had become an untrustworthy detainee, someone whose past terrorist behavior was not serious, whose malicious intent was not deep, and who had voluntarily surrendered, proving that he had recognized his own guilt and was in need of repentance. In some ways, Iskander's eventual detention on May 14, 2017 did not seem like a surprise to his family. Everyone in the community had been through countless thought work and struggle sessions already, and many others had already been taken. But still Iskander's family wanted to believe that the school where they, had, where they took Iskander was really a school. At first, they were able to have monthly supervised phone calls with him at the work brigade office. Then about six months after he was taken, he was allowed to have one visit in the visitation center of the camp where they observed that the camp was more like a prison than a school. They realized then why Iskander's speech had been so stilted on the phone. He was terrified that he would say something wrong, but there was still a lot that they didn't know. For instance, they didn't know that he was hooded and shackled when he was transferred from his cell to the visitation area right before he met them. 
They didn't know about the beatings, the being forced to sit on stools for countless hours. They learned this only later when one of his classmates was released and returned to their village and told them about what he had experienced along with Iskender. Toward the end of 2018, the family received notice that Mahmoud's brother Iskander was being transferred to the county seat to work in a tightly monitored textile factory owned by a corporation from Eastern China, something that was set up through the Aid Xinjiang campaign. They were not permitted to visit the factory even though it was less than 100 kilometers from the village. Four years after his self-confession and entry into the re-education system, there does not appear to be any end in sight. In many ways, Iskender's legal person has become a digital file, categorized as untrustworthy, as a terrorist worker. The son of a, former, of a farmer prone to terrorist tendencies, his self-confession has rendered him one of more than these tw of 20,000 terrorist workers, people in the same category uh, who now work in the capital of his prefecture. And this is just the available data we have, um, that there's at least 20,000 um, that have been sent as part of this program. To his family, it seems that Iskander is, is serving an indefinite sentence as a terrorist worker, forever stuck in a legal space where his crime was not serious, his intent was not malicious, um, but he had confessed uh, to being just guilty enough to always be perpetually an unfree worker. His life had been subtracted, which is a, a term I'll return to at the end of this talk. Based on currently available data, it is likely that several hundred thousand Uyghur and Kazakh villagers like Iskender have gone through the camp system and now work in factories in Xinjiang. Available evidence shows that an additional several hundred thousand villagers who were not detained have also been assigned to work in Xinjiang and in other parts of the country. While these workers are not subjected to the same types of restrictions and control as former detainees, such as Iskender, they are also not free to leave the place of employment or to negotiate their salary or you know, to have any sort of um, say in, in their work conditions. Refusing government management can always be read as a sign of resistance. The category of terrorist worker hangs over them too as a perpetual threat. This is why Iskender's father did not protest when the work brigade announced in 2020 that they were taking 70% of, of his 50 acres of farmland and leasing it to a Han owned corporate farm. They told him he should think of it as a liberation that now he, had, he would have time to find part-time work, even though he was nearing the age of retirement. Across Xinjiang, land has been taken from Uyghur and Kazakh villagers as part of an effort to turn them into industrial work, workers dependent on uh, the Chinese labor market. In Iskender's prefecture, 58,000 families were given the opportunity to relinquish 379,000 acres in this manner, resulting in job assignments for 73,300 people. This is a, a really widespread phenomenon. Um, and I'd point you to the work of, of Guldana Salimjan, um, who's written about this uh, in relation to Kazakh herders in Northern Xinjiang, whose land has also been taken in this way. Um, she's published uh, on this in the Made in China Journal and also in uh, Laosan. Um, so you could, could take a look at her article if you're interested in, in more on this, on the, the removal from the land. So what does this have to do with terror capitalism? Well, Iskender's predicament as a worker without access to legal prediction, protections is symptomatic of broader settler colonial circumstances uh, in contemporary Northwest China and our contemporary moment of global capitalism. As the anthropologist Kassan Haj has argued, all settler societies produce apartheid-like tendencies, dividing colonizers from colonized by heightening racialized and cultural differences. This elaboration is often accomplished through legal mechanisms that normalize the placement of the colonized in an exceptional place of increased vulnerability. That is to say, colonial logics produce expropriable land by removing the colonized from it. And at the same time, the super exploitation of workers 
by removing their civil protections. So it, there's an art of, there's a, a devaluation of their labor, which allows um, them to be exploited in, 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 a, in a way that's above and beyond how others are exploited in similar circumstances or in the same space, um, just with different legal protections. As anthropologists such as Carolina Sanchez Bow and Nicholas de Geneva have demonstrated, in the settler societies of North America, these systems continue to function by illegalizing undocumented and otherwise devalued populations, rendering them detainable, pushing them into the gray economy as construction workers, chicken butchers, nannies, cleaners, and so on. Um, these people are the, those that build, clean, and feed the society protected at, by the legal system and by their wealth. In, in a time of global and domestic counterterrorism, when Muslim immigrants bleed into the undocumented enemy aliens and colonized native populations um, around them, these logics are heightened. They move from the colonial centers of East of Europe and North America to sub-imperial settler colonial spaces like Xinjiang and Kashmir. Um, spaces that are nested within older histories of imperialism. Like capitalist frontier making, um, which centers on production and management of environmental disasters or the production and exploitation of data, the logics of counterterrorism can be put to new forms of work. In my book, I argue that the conceptual frame that best captures this emergent worker category is terror capitalism. Like other frontiers of global capitalism, such as disaster capitalism and surveillance capitalism, there's been a sort of proliferation of different kinds of capitalism as, as scholars are thinking about what capitalism is doing as it expands into new frontiers uh, and, and becomes global. Terror capitalism is doing something similar to these other forms of capitalism by calling attention toward novel formations of, of economy and power. Um, it's also importantly focusing attention on the way these dynamics should all should be thought of as articulated to ongoing imperialist and colonial processes of racialized capitalism. And here I'm, I'm thinking about the work of Cedric Robinson and others um, who are, are thinking about how uh, racialization is always part of the process of capitalist expansion. So what is disaster capitalism? Well, disaster capitalism theorizes the economic and political complex that responds to emergent disasters associated with, with global climate change, a type of counter disaster capitalism that justifies itself by masking the role of capitalism and political ideology in the production of disasters, which it is set up to counter. Um, so you know, ongoing consumption of fossil fuels, um, you know, denial of climate change is what's fueling the disasters which need to be countered by this type of, uh, of complex. Similarly, surveillance capitalism or data valence capitalism hides in plain sight, masking the production of differential control and the exploitation of precarious, often racialized workers through a patina of smart convenience. This is why we all you know, are using smartphones um, and also our Amazon Prime members. Uh, because we need this convenience and we also want that logistical speed. We want to have things delivered to us you know, whenever we need them. Um, and we're aware of this surveillance. We've consented to it. We're bothered by it. Um, but often we're not thinking about how the, this type of surveillance targets minorities, marginalized people, the undocumented, the colonized in, in much stronger ways, in ways that are life altering um, in terms of what's available to them uh, in terms of their opportunities. You know, all of these global formations, surveillance capitalism and disaster capitalism are connected to racialized capitalism, which describes the way economic frontier making modes of imperialism and colonialism are premised on the capturing and, of the land and labor of ethno-racialized others a type of colonial capitalism that justifies itself by masking the production of race and differential value. So here we can go all the way back to Marx and think about primitive accumulation, 
or original accumulation, and how it's ongoing, how it, the, the production of difference is, is essential to finding new ways of exploiting labor and of capturing land and resources. Terror capitalism, and you know, this is where I'm, I'm turning all of these for, formations in a new direction, is related to these framings of contemporary global systems and histories. On the one hand, it's a type of counter-terrorism capitalism premised on the prevention of the disaster-like terrorist event, you know, something similar to disaster capitalism. However, naming it counter-terrorism capitalism would obfuscate the way the capitalist formation itself produces the figure of the terrorist as its object of investment. And so I don't want to call it counter-terrorism capitalism, both because it's sort of a, a big mouthful and also because it's hiding the production of the terrorist. Um, naming it counterterrorism capitalism would obfuscate the way the capitalist formation itself produces the figure of the terrorist as its object of investment. Terrorists and terrorisms are not a priori givens, but rather historically contingent phenomena which must always be continually produced by identifying particular religious practices, political activity, and at times the violence of particular people as an exceptional kind of crime and criminal body. So you know, the, the term terrorism as it's used today really emerges out of um, you know, North African decolonial movements, you know, pushing back against the empire and also you know, the, the Irish experience, um, but now has been turned towards uh, Muslims in general um, and particularly Muslim men, which is why I focused, or one of the reasons why I focused so much in the book on, on, on Uyghur men. Um, you know, the other reasons having to do with my positionality as a male researcher, and also um, the way that you know, men are the dominant group of migrants that come to the city, which is the site of my research. Um, okay, so creating, treating terrorism as a concrete object that would be count, that can be countered, masks the novel form of global racialization that's attached to Muslim bodies as a result of the global war on terror. Terror capitalism is about the production of the terrorist, about producing terrorist workers, slotting subjects into a juridical category and converting them into the object of the technological gaze. This in turn allows for the expropriation of their land. You can see this with you know, what's happened to Iskander's family's land and Iskander's labor, um, as he is always a potential terrorist. So you know, that's you know, why I'm thinking about uh, terror capitalism as the conceptual frame. But, you know, there's a, a, a few other things we could think about in relation to this. Uh, you know, why terror capitalism and not just simply a, a more descriptive security industrial complex? Now, it is a security industrial complex, um, but what I'm trying to argue here is that terror capitalism is also productive, that it's doing something. Um, that it's um, intervening in society and in global economy. Uh, so, you know, the first sort of thing that's produced is it's producing research and development through private public partnerships, um, through um, Chinese tech firms. There's around $10 billion or so invested in computer vision, AI systems and projects in Xinjiang. Um, that allow those companies access to vast amounts of data, um, both from the state's you know, data collection that it has through the ID system, but also ongoing collection of data at checkpoints. Um, in addition, it allows them space to develop new analytical tools, prediction products that can be sold within this space, but also marketed elsewhere. The system also is, you know, connected to the, the national development agenda of the Xi administration, which is to produce the sort of fourth industrial revolution uh, by putting China at the forefront of artificial intelligence development by 2030. And so a number of the companies working in this space uh, in Xinjiang are um, you know, national champions uh, that are given sort of exceptional status within the Chinese state as, as companies that will rival the you know, Silicon Valley companies. Along with this, of course, it's also producing new forms of carceral control, um, projecting it onto space. And you know, this has a lot of implications for the political system in China itself, 
um, and the way that it can be sold in bits and pieces along the Belt and Road, which is something that the tech firms talk about as, as part of their goal. The main focus of my book, though, is, is not on these things as much as on the effects that it has on Uyghur society itself, how it's producing these new political and laboring subjects, uh, the, with the, the terrorist worker being one of them. Um, and here I'm really thinking in, in relation to um, scholarship, um, a lot of mostly feminist scholarship of capitalism um, that looks at the way you know, contemporary capitalism is producing new or heightened forms of individuated labor and also eating into social, the social reproduction of society by um, placing the burden of social reproduction on, on women, which is historically the case, but also racialized minorities, um, expanding the service economy and the service sector and slotting people into that sector, um, that there's a kind of hardening actually of boundaries, um, at least for, for many. Another thing that's happening here is a collapsing of space between the prison work and the smart factory. Um, so there's a, a kind of pipeline from the prison or the camp to the factory and they become um, you know, part of the same uh, complex, which um, is a new development in factory uh, manufacturing, uh, where it's not quite prison work. It's also not quite factory work. Um, it's an unfree environment um, that's in between both. It functions by producing through the production of zones of inclusion and exclusion. Um, which is um, working in, in, a, in a few different ways to create a kind of flexible enclosure system, a digital apartheid system that separates experience for differently, differently identified groups of people um, who live within the same space. So there's you know, green lanes for those that are identified as non-Muslim and as, as trustworthy, uh, whereas the Muslim population are checked you know, over and over and over again. Um, and so here there's a, a kind of super panoptic exclusion, or sorry, inclusion, super panoptic inclusion, uh, which has to do with the way that, um, you know, the panopticon is now digitized and automated. So it doesn't matter if, if there's a guard in the watchtower or not, the computer is always watching. So it's always on, always there controlling our behavior, um, particularly those that are being targeted by this system. Um, and it's also building on the, the ban optic um, which you know, comes from DDA Bijou, um, where there's um, a segmenting of society profiling, um, which is now widespread in the world. Um, the Xinjiang case is, is perhaps you know, at the limit of where these systems can go simply because of the scale, density, and legal system that supports them. Um, but my argument is that you know, these, what's happening in Xinjiang is symptomatic of systems that are being used in many places in the world. The same technologies are in London, are, are in New York City as are in Xinjiang, um, just with variation in terms of, of who's targeted and how. So here's maybe the most fundamental question that many of you may have about terror capitalism, why that and not the authoritarian state? Um, well, I'm not saying that China, the Chinese political system is not an authoritarian state. I'm just saying that it, thinking about what's happening in Xinjiang is, is not quite, it's not completely um, or adequately addressed by thinking only at the political register. We have to also understand the economic logics that drive this. Um, and so for me, it's an empirical question. The, the material antagonism of, um, you know, of the, the state and also migrant labor arriving, you know, non-Muslim labor arriving in Xinjiang in the 1990s and 2000s uh, and the way that they dispossess Uyghurs of their land and you know, along with that, um, captured their institutions. That is the underlying tension that results in, in Uyghur resistance, in violence, in protest. Um, and, and so you know, the authoritarian response, the police state response is, is something that's responding to that underlying material antagonism. And so I think we need to start there if we wanna understand um, how we get to the authoritarian state in this context. Um, it's also, you know, the, you know, they're borrowing from past political practice from the Maoist period when it comes to camps, um, but still it's, it's in response and in, 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 in effect 
um, to protect capital at this point, rather than uh, um, you know a sort of socialist ideology or or um, political power. Um, although of course it's also protecting political power, so we can't separate these things completely. I'm just saying I want to look at the economic um, as a as a major driver in addition to these other things. I'm also concerned about using the frame of state terror as the sole driver, or only driver, um, since that presumes a kind of inherent irrational hatred you know, of um, the, the state, the Chinese state, or the Han settler population towards Uyghurs. Um, that doesn't seem to adequately, at least in my, in my view, adequately um, explain why why Han people arrived and what they think they're doing in Xinjiang. They wanted the resources that were there. Um, and you know they weren't coming to Xinjiang simply because they hated Uyghurs. Um, the, the racialization is something that comes after. Uh, totalitarian governance as a sole driver assumes that there's a kind of perfect police state that's acting in isolation, um, which I don't think is true, um, and um, at least not at this point. You know, the technologies are being borrowed from elsewhere. It's not a perfect system. Um, there's a lot of uh, citizen and private company buy-in into the system, um, and so um, you know, it's not as though it's all top-down. There's a lot of um, underlying uh, force that's coming out of the population of, of the Han settlers itself. I want to avoid the great man or ideology led approach to history of the present. You know, so I'm trying to say that you know, Chen Chuanguo and Xi Jinping definitely play a lot of, you know, a, a central role in this system. Um, but they're responding to material circumstances. They're figuring things out as they go. Um, and, you know, I want to look at this from, from the bottom up. Um, from the low-level functionaries and from the people that are actually affected by these systems, rather than focusing my attention on on, on those you know great men or bad men, I don't whatever you want to call them. Um, I'm also wanting to think about uh, the, an object of critique that goes beyond China, because I want to I want to understand this as part of a global system of counterterrorism, the global war on terror which comes out of Western context, comes out of you know, the Iraq um, and Afghanistan context, is really fed by the rise of the Islamic State in, in, um, in China. That was a lot of what was motivating, at least initial response um, to Uyghurs in 2014 and 15, as they thought, oh, they're becoming like the Taliban, they're becoming like the Islamic State. And they're really receiving that information from global media um, and then projecting it onto Uyghurs. There's also tactical systems, which you know is like counterinsurgency theory, also preventative policing systems, um, and the technologies themselves, which are borrowed from the West, at least initially, and then adapted for um, you know their own purposes in Xinjiang. Another thing I'm really interested in and wanting to attend to is the eventfulness of what's happening here. That this is part of um, a global change in how the system works, um, how um, and the global system works, capitalism works in the world. That has to do with global China, has to do with the Chinese economy in general, um, how there's overcapacity in other parts of the economy. And so they're needing new spaces to invest, Xinjiang being one of those places. Um, and also how the, these technologies, you know, artificial intelligence itself, in terms of being something that's scalable and can be put in, in motion is really only five years old. And so you know, I don't think Xinjiang could happen 10 years ago, uh, at least not in the same way as it's happening now um, with the way that um, technology has been used, um, data valence has been used uh, to decide who should be detained. So, you know, in the end of the day, what I'm doing is sort of troubling the easy binary between, between liberal and illiberal systems, between the West and China, um, and, and wanting to argue that within Western systems, there's illiberalism as well, especially if you're an unwanted minority, you're an undocumented person, the system does not appear liberal to you. Um, it, it is, in fact, um, something that's quite illiberal. Um, and so I, I'm 
you know, that's, you know, part of the critique here is we need to critique uh, counterterrorism and preventative policing systems of ex exclusion in every context, not only in Xinjiang. And while at the same time, of course, you know, maintaining that what's happening in Xinjiang is, is an extreme example. It's, it's, it's one of the worst systems in the world. All of this, I hope my work in general demands an active internationalist, anti-racist, decolonial analytic and practice, um, which means that we need to go from both the sub-imperial, Xinjiang, Kashmir, these places that are you know, inheriting imperial and colonial logics from past experience of being a former colony, uh, which is something that Natasha Kal has written really well about. Um, you know, where she's thinking about the colonial wound and how it motivates new forms of colonialism in, in both of these contexts. Um, so we need to, you know, be thinking about that. And we also, at the same time, need to be actively decolonizing our own spaces. Um, the, the still imperial centers in, in Europe, um, the settler colonies in Australia and North America. Okay, so, you know, that's what I'm hoping that, you know, comes through um, in understanding, reading this book, encountering terror capitalism as a concept. Well, how do I actually go about doing it in the book? Uh, well, uh, my book shows how terror capitalism, terror capitalism was built by first presenting the arrival of digital enclosure systems and the processes of evaluation and dispossession that preceded and accompanied them. It shows how the heritage trades of Uyghur migrants to the city, were devalued and outlawed and replaced by the market economy brought by non-Muslim migrants. And so you know, this is the first three chapters of the book, um, enclosure, devaluation, and dispossession. The second half of the book shows how Uyghur young men protected each other from the emergence of terror capitalism by building friendship networks and religious economies. They taught me how storytelling Sharing food and religious practice restores agency and authority to people in vulnerable situations. <clears throat> in, in chapter five, I also show how a, lo a local Han documentary photographer I call Chen Ye, identified as a Xinjiang person and a placeless migrant in distinction from the ethno-nationalist masculinity that suffused so much of Xinjiang Han society. So he saw himself as a placeless person um, as someone who was in a similar position to the Uyghur migrants he was meeting, you know, someone who identified as a Xinjiang Ren or Ben Di Ren. Um, Chen Ye became an active witness to the suffering of Uyghurs around him um, and attempted to generate a type of minor politics. And so I spent a bit of time thinking about what is a minor politics or grassroots politics, uh, really sort of drawing from Xu Mei Shi's work um, in, in Taiwan. Uh, he re Chen Ye refused to remain silent and thus complicit in the project of slotting Uyghurs into a terrorism category. Instead, he actively aided Uyghurs in finding a right to the city by helping to navigate the bureaucratic system and building solidarity for them in the Han community. As one of my Uyghur interviewees, Abla Kim, put it, he was this close. I put my, the, the distance between my thumb and finger. Uh, he is this close to understanding what life is like for us. Um, and, and that closeness, that intimacy or proximity was um, something that was really meaningful to him and to other Uyghurs that encountered Chenya's practice. Ultimately though, like this book, Chenya's minor grassroots politics failed to protect Uyghurs who shared their knowledge with him and with me. There are no saviors no easy solutions for the decimation that the past decade has brought to the Uyghurs. Instead, there's been a radical subtraction of Uyghur life that has fed the machine of terror capitalism. As this new frontier of capital is built, it ate into Uyghur social reproduction, gnawing it to the bone. The life potential of the disappeared was subtracted, holding in tension the lives of their families as well. All of Uyghur society now exists under a type of techno-political status coercion. At any point in response to labor demands, the political pressure and political pressure, the parameters of the policing algorithms and also the legal system can be tightened or loosened 
shifting the axis of the trustworthy, untrustworthy, terrorist, non-terrorist binary. In this sense, then, even those who are not deemed terrorist workers, like Iskander, are nevertheless always already potentially terrorist workers, one errant WeChat post away from raising a red warning in a scan. Social subtraction in this context means reducing Uyghur migrants and Uyghurs in general to their data and labor power, transforming their bodies into biometric code, a surplus workforce whose value can be exchanged for profits. Their, pr this, their process of disappearance differed and, and continues to differ from the forms of genocidal violence where unwanted bodies are simply killed and buried in mass graves. In this context, state authorities and private proxies strive to make Uyghurs productive through subtraction. The dynamic of terror capitalism first devalued their knowledge and practices and then dispossessed them of autonomy through the use of new technology. Eventually then, especially in, in, in 2017, it began to radically subtract the social autonomy of their bodies by tracking their usage of the technologies that had been given to them just in the years before. All of this together is what has turned Uyghurs into a general population of terrorist workers. So that's what I wanted to share with you. Um, hopefully, you know, some of that made sense. Um, if not, I'm happy to tease out things that, that I, I, I said um, and looking forward to a conversation. Darren, thank you so much. I think we can definitely ask you to do a bit of teasing out in a minute. Uh, but um, uh, let me see. Let's uh, let Darren uh, get his breath for a couple of minutes. Uh, and I will um, encourage some more questions, please. It's great to see a few questions, good questions there in the Q&A. Thank you very much for those. We're going to attend to them in just a moment. Please do add yours to, to the list. Oh, we've got some good, serious questions here. Superb. But meantime, I'm going to take chair's privilege, if I may, because most of these questions look quite heavily, um, you know, on the macro analysis and I'm, I am interested in, as I say, in the human experience. So, um, you know, uh, Darren, it's very interesting to see you trying to um, encompass the whole of this big, um, finely argued book, um, which makes a, a really quite original argument in this this context, huh? and then to, to squish it into a seminar. It's always enjoyable watching someone uh, uh, do that. So, uh, I, I think you've done a great job, you know, but um, I recommend the, the book to everyone as well. Okay, so that's one thing. Um, I, I, I was struck there with your your explanation of of um, your ideas on terror capitalism you know i i, I find it a, a persuasive term i certainly do um one of the things that struck me just there listening was was your repeated emphasis on the question of buy-in buy-in from various um actors in this whole situation you know and that was really striking in the book as well so um, you have quite a long section about Han Chinese migrants in Xinjiang and the way that they respond to uh, what's going on around them and how they really seem so insensible to, to Uyghur suffering and exploitation and dispossession uh, and can't really engage with the idea that their, their good fortune, their ability to, to make a good life in Xinjiang is directly built on the suffering of others so i thought that was very striking and then thinking about your um your portrayal of of this um photographer who you call chenye uh you know i mean i i think it's really great to focus on the these kind of individual efforts to actually engage and see what is going on but again um i was struck by the way that chenye was um uh, regarded by other Chinese uh, around him as being mentally ill. What's your problem? You know, why are you hanging out with these these poor, dirty um, 
wiggles you know you must be mentally ill and of course that kind of attitude does does help to explain how people do close their eyes to to what's going on all around them um so i i just found that interesting i wonder if you had any response to that mm. well i mean some of some of that distance um that dissociation uh to uyghur suffering it, it has to do with where people live with like their proximity to each other um so you know throughout xinjiang until quite recently at least uh, people lived in different parts of the city and so they didn't see each other or if they lived in northern Xinjiang there just really weren't very many Uyghurs around um, and or you know Uyghurs are, are living in rural areas they're the people that um, you know are selling food at a restaurant but you know you don't really engage with them at sort of a, a human and daily level um, that's more the case with people who came more recently people who um, migrated in the 1990s to 2000s um, to build the pipelines and roads, um, to work in the service sector, um, to work in, in the cotton fields and then become, you know, stay in Xinjiang because there's so many jobs to be had and because uh, the cost of living is so much lower. A lot of the Han migrants I met would talk about how they had first tried to go to places like Shenzhen or Shanghai, or in some cases even traveled abroad, had gone to Malaysia or or to um, you know North Africa uh, to work on some of these global China projects and like you know that was all fine and like they made money but they said they're making more money in Xinjiang and you know they have everything they need to actually you know establish life um, that there's like a, a community of people from the same province um, sometimes from the same communities where they're from in eastern China um and the state is there to protect them and so they they felt like for the first time that they were a wanted presence in the city whereas elsewhere in china they're often you know denied full access to the city due to their household registration status um so you know for them like this was a new start on life and you know a lot of them are coming from a, a extreme forms of poverty in eastern china and so this is a they're not thinking about you know what what cost at what cost is their better life um, being given to them. Chen Ye, the photographer, is you know, grew up in Xinjiang, um, in the Bing Tuan. His his family was from Anhui, um, but in the nineties he became a he got training to be a photographer because it seemed like it it was a it was something he was interested in. He thought he could make a, a better life for himself couldn't really make a go of it as a professional photographer. Um, there just wasn't enough business, um, but he got, he had his own dark room that he had built in his house and he just got interested in taking pictures and, and you know, traveling outside of the city. And um, he started encountering these Uyghurs in the, in the settlements and was just really taken by the, the warmth that they showed him at times, but also the, the poverty and precarity of their lives. Um, and he thought that the world should know about it. And so he started taking pictures of it and then began to develop relationship with those, those people. And you're right, like other photographers, other people he met, his own family members thought that he had some kind of mental problem because he was spending so much of his time in the Uyghur community, um, you know, helping them with bureaucracy, um, helping them to, to make it in some way and also just showing some care. And, and and conveying that to other people, um, and you know some of that you know mental illness accusation had to do with him not um, caring about his own well being in terms of the, his own economy because he was you know not working as much as they thought he should, um, but a lot of it had to do with the way he was setting himself up in direct opposition to what the state wanted um, that he was. Um, you know, spending time with what is you know, people that are referred to as backward in the Han Chinese community in Xinjiang um, and um, people that have no value and that are potentially dangerous. Um, and, and so, you know, people just saw him as wasting his life, I think, by, by doing that. Um, and that's, I think, symptomatic of where there's this disconnect, where they're not seeing each other as fully human. Um, and that they're really sort of, like you said, or I said, buying in to the, the state project and seeing it as beneficial to themselves um, and refusing to see the humanity of the other. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, and I, I think um, the things that you say about um, suju, what do you say, acquired value, yeah, I think is also very interesting in, in that context. But let us turn to a few of the questions. Now we've got lots, thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, I see that we have a few questions um, which touch on the question of the international response uh, to the crisis. So, so um, could we perhaps go there? I can see um, Sarada Mahesh um, asking about the, the role of international human rights actors like the UN, well, or international NGOs. What can they do about it um, uh, without facing the counter argument of non infringement in a state sovereign sovereignty? Cool. Um, can I also um, bring in a question from Emma Holdsworth, um, who's asking if China is challenging the established global legal order in regards to how they treat the Uyghur population, um, specifically in regards to their refusal of the responsibility to protect notion, which would enable the international community to intervene uh, or through their defining of the Uyghur population as terrorists of the state. Hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of biggies for you. Right. Okay. Um, so what can the UN do? Uh, well, it can do more, I suppose. Um, it, one of the things that it's done so far is it in, at some of the committee levels, it's called out the, the Chinese members you know, of those of those committees um, asking for a response. And the, the first document I quoted from in my talk today comes from a UN document um, where they're defining, saying who's been detained, why have they been detained? It's because they've um, been involved in terrorist and extremist activities that are not serious. Um, so it's, you know, it, it's speaking to the definitions of terrorism that are in operation in China, which are very, very broad. They're the, they're the broadest, as far as I can tell, broadest counterterrorism laws in the world. Um, almost any activity that Uyghurs carry out that is contrary to what the state wants is a terrorist or extremist activity. And extremism and terrorism should be understood as on a continuum, that extremism is what leads to terrorism, according to the logic of, of the state documents. So the UN has held, you know, at least in, in that committee level, some people to account. Um, when it comes to uh, higher level deliberations, you know, I've, I know the UN High Commission is working on this, uh, the, the, the Human Rights uh, Commission. Um, they have a report that's in the works. Um, I know they've spoken to many people like myself, to former detainees as well. Um, they have the information um, and they would like to visit, I think, but I think they want to do it um, and, and they want to do it with, you know, with their eyes open. Um, but of course, the UN is a is a body that has, you know, people from all countries who are often in sway with China. That especially, you know, people that are part of the Belt and Road, you know, these countries that are part of the Belt and Road, where their economy is dependent on on good relations with China. And so, it's a big ask, actually, for many of these countries in terms of taking a stand on this. Um, so, you know, the the UN is a is a bureaucratic body that's really hard to move, um, but I think it can do more and, and I think will do more um, in, in you know the months to come. In terms of the second question, I'm sort of blanking on exactly what the question was, refusal of responsibility to protect. Um, who, let me see that question again, or could you clarify a little bit, Rachel? Um, is China challenging the established global legal order? Uh, in regards to their refusal of the notion of responsibility to protect, um, which would enable the community to intervene, Emma, mm. Emma is arguing. Uh huh. Um, well, yes, probably so. I'm not an international legal expert, so it's hard for me to really parse all you know how how the intervention is happening exactly. Um, but certainly, I mean, the Chinese argument is that human rights means protecting the majority from threats. And if Uyghurs are terrorists or potentially terrorists, um, protecting the you know, majority population from them is a human rights protection. Um, and so that I think is how they would frame the human rights protection. 
um, in their context. Um, they're not thinking from the perspective of the minority, from the people that are on the margins. Um, you know, they they haven't gone through sort of through civil rights um, protest and struggle in the way that you know we've seen in the United States, where you know minorities have asserted their voices and demanded that they reserve, they deserve protection. That's just not available to Uyghurs. They can't protest. Um, and within the country, they don't have enough support from the general population to engage in those courts of protests either. Um, so sure, I think China is, you know, changing international norms on this topic uh, in this domain, if they're able to proceed as they want to proceed. And so, you know, we need to oppose that, I think. But again, I'm, this isn't really my area, so. <laughs> good, good job. Okay, um, perhaps we could turn to a different side of things. There's a couple of interesting questions about um, the the impact of um, terror capitalism. Oh, um, okay, so from Lev Ab uh, Akbulut, is that? Um, what role, if any, does the fetishize, oh, sorry, fetishization of Uyghur women play in the counter-terrorism capitalism. So what, mm -hmm. what the fetishization of mm -hmm. Uyghur women, what role does that play in terror capitalism? Uh, and another one uh, about Uyghurs living um, outside of Xinjiang, Uyghurs who are ostensibly, you know, good Uyghurs um, in, in the States, good graces, says Benson Chung. So he's, he's asking about, um, Oh, uh, Dilnigar Ilham Jan, right? The uh, the Olympic torchbearer. How are they? How are people like that implicated and ensnared? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, in the history of colonialism and imperialism, there has been a feminist sort of strain that you know the 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 women in the colonies are either you know too free or not free enough. Um, that they're dressed immodestly and so they need like good Christian clothes or they're too veiled and so they need to be liberated from their veils. Um, that's, you know, something that goes back centuries really. Um, and you see it expressed in more contemporary logics in the global war on terror with, you know, Laura Bush talking about invading Afghanistan as you know, essential to protecting and liberating Afghan women. Um, you know, there's, and so that's kind of an imperialist feminism. That's not a real feminism. It's a it's a false feminism. That's you know, extending state power and imperial power through um, this domain, or this sort of gendered logic. Um, it's projecting sort of white liberal values onto the colonized and saying they need this. The Chinese case is you know, something similar that you know, Uyghur women need to be saved from Uyghur men. Not not really understanding that those men are you know the fathers, the husbands, the sons of those women, and that it might be better to actually ask the women what they want rather than presuming that they're unhappy and that they feel um, that you know Uyghur culture and, and Islamic traditions are oppressing them. Um, so there's a lot of discourse you see in the Chinese state propaganda that talks about you know what's coming out of this camp and and working system is a liberation of the women, that women are now working in the factories. And there is a, a larger proportion of people that came out of the camps and are working in factories that are women uh, relative to men, at least that's what it appears. Um, so yes, you know, making women productive members of society, those that you know, you're going to, they're gonna you know, care for themselves and not depend on men is um, part of the logic of what's going on here. Um, and then of course, there's the, the position of the the good Uyghur, the good Muslim, around something on the order of you know 40, 50,000 of the recently hired police are Uyghur Kazakhs, um, other minorities who are uh, took up the position of assistant police in 2017 as a way of protecting themselves often and also to have you know, finding jobs because they're you know, underemployed. Um, and then found themselves low-level functionaries in the camp system and in the surveillance system, um, and you know often began to have to target people in their own communities. They saw their own cousins, their own you know, relatives being taken away, and they realized that you know they could be taken as well, and so they had to stay in their position as functionaries. Um, 
there's others. I don't know what Dilnagar's uh, circumstances are exactly. I know that both her mother and father are state employees. Her father was in the military. Um, it's you know very likely that you know she, her family has benefited in some way, have been isolated from some of the worst aspects of this system, perhaps. Um, and so it's it's a way of her protecting herself as well um, by you know performing for the state. When the state says light the torch, like you go light the torch. You really can't say no. Um, and and it could also be, and you know this happens. Uh, in the Xinjiang case and in many colonial cases where the you know, people that are in the collaborator position you know, identify with the colonizer and um, see themselves as different from um, the people that are being detained, uh, the people that are being colonized, um, that you know, th those bad Uyghurs are the reasons why we have all these problems. And so they you know, accept that and, 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 and participate in it. Um, that's an element of the system. We know though that like the state has enforced the coercion by uh, prosecuting as many as 12,000 low level officer or state employees. Some of them may be Han, but many are probably Uyghur as well. Um, prosecuting them for showing mercy or for not um, you know, following through as earnestly as they're supposed to in the mass detentions. Um, so you know, there's coercion all the way down and the low level functionaries who don't have a lot of power um, are not the people I think we should be placing the blame on as much as those that are higher in command and really orchestrating and designing the system. Great, Baron, thank you. Oh, we've got a lot of interesting questions here. I, I can see some splendid um, opportunities for a, a big loud debate, which sadly we can't have in this forum. Uh, but I can see um, Dibyesh Anand, lovely to see you, Dibyesh, wanting to know why you're not calling it terror communism. Huh? And then if I scroll down a little bit, somebody else is wanting to know why you're not calling it terror colonialism. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure you if, if you have a kind of short and pithy answer to, to those rather large questions, Darren, but um, oh, yeah, that, that's Natasha. Cool, actually. <laughs> you, Natasha, hey. Uh, sure, I can respond qu quickly or try to. Um, well, I, I don't know that the Chinese state is really communist any longer um, in terms of a lot of the features of communism. It's, it really is functioning as a capitalist state. There is a strong state capital presence in the system, you know, a lot of state controls, um, but it's, you know, pretty cutthroat private private uh, enterprise across the country now. Um, even the state-owned enterprises are sort of being dismantled and replaced by private public partnerships, by a more nimble um, companies that they think can compete more effectively with Western companies. You know, the, the wealth gap is really um, out of control across the country. It, they're drawing, of course, from communist uh, political logics and tactics um, as they're thinking about the camp system, but they're also borrowing from the West, uh, from you know, the global war on terror. Um, and you know, I'm also cognizant of the rising xenophobia in the world, the red scare kind of language that's very present in Western discourse. And so I wanna avoid that, um, especially when I'm writing about something that's very present, you know, contemporary, that is, um, really emerges out of the 1990s and the you know, and global capitalism. So um, yeah, I don't know if communism would be the right term. Colonialism, yes, I mean, it is a, it obviously is colonialism, um, but I'm trying to show that it's connected to global capital and that, that colonialism is one frontier. This is a, a colonial frontier of global capital. So I think we, I wanna think about them together. Um, that I think also helps me to do the work of thinking about this as a, a part of a global system um, and you know, intervening in that way. Um, it does, I think, you know, what's happening to the Uyghurs is, is a colonial sp system and, and space and the closest analogs, Kashmir, Palestine are also colonial. Um, and so I think colonialism, where you have the subject population be targeted in this way, you know, is, is where you see um, the kind of terror capital logics playing out to their fullest extent. 
Great, thank you, Darren. Okay, um, I, I can see we have like a rather large number of questions from Reinhard Fang, um, who's fantastically enthusiastic. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Uh, you were the first person to to drop a question in the Q and A, and uh, there's been quite a lot since. So I will. Okay, so there's. Uh, let's take them. Um, there's there's a few iterations of the question. Um, what do you think about the, the 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 government denial of what's happening in the concentration camps in Xinjiang is the wording used here uh, and perhaps more interesting to to engage with is is the question which is also picked up by a few other people in in the q a here about whether this um, terror capitalist system in Xinjiang might be spread to other parts of China? What are the possibilities? What is the likelihood of that? Um, if that mm -hmm. not to happen, why not? Um, yeah. So the possibilities for it to spread. Mm -hmm. Well, I think my, my sense is that the Chinese state uh, was a bit surprised, taken aback by world response to the camp system. I think they felt like, or maybe they didn't, they didn't know what the world would do. Um, I think they thought they could get away with it, could do what they want. And, um, but, you know, there has been a, a global response to this. Um, and it's really, I think, produced a moral cost um, that's just beginning to be felt in China and an economic cost as well, um, with particularly when it comes to um, textile manufacturing, with a lot of um, companies re moving their supply chains to other places. Um, with sanctions of some of the tech companies that are involved as well, at least um, in the U.S. So, you know, sanctions in the U.S. So, so I think that is, you know, something that has prompted the Chinese state to want to really reclaim the narrative. And that's why we see a number of camps closed. Some of them turned into Kanshuosuo, which is um, detention centers that are part of the formal prison system. You know, they just sort of changed the name of the facility from closed concentrated education center to uh, pre-trial detention center. Um, and so there's, you know, a shifting that's happening quite quickly um, and I think reactively to international pressure. They also have mobilized the publicity department or ministry, um, you know, state media in China to create propaganda, to uh, facilitate um, visits that, you know, give people an alibi if they want an alibi, uh, a way of explaining away um, the evidence that is so massive at this point of, you know, mass atrocities. Um, so, you know, that's, I think what they're trying to do is they wanna maintain control. They wanna act as though this never happened and say, everything is fine. There's nothing that's happened. And at the same time say, we did it, it's great. Um, no terrorism any longer. Um, in terms of spread, I, you know, it's the colonial context where you see it spreading most, you know, where the possibility of spread is most likely. Um, already a, a number of the scanning tools that they use in Xinjiang are being used um, in uh, um, border areas, you know, international airports, um, in places like Ningxia, which is the Hui Autonomous Region. Um, there's also you know, transfer of personnel from Xinjiang to other places. We see this in Hong Kong now. I think Hong Kong is probably the site where there's the most urgency around this type of spread, uh, where we have an active you know, internal colonization happening. Um, and so, you know, new forms of policing, new forms of surveillance that are, might come out of Xinjiang, that's probably where we'll see them most because the state is very concerned with Xinjiang. You know, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, that's, there's potential there too. Um, I don't see that being used to target regular folks in China so much, um, just because I think, um, you know, they want to maintain sort of popular support for the state, for the party. Um, but, you know, you can't rule it out either. You know, targeted minorities everywhere in China, I think, should be concerned about these kinds of systems. Uh -huh. Uh, I'm tempted to ask what on earth you mean by regular folks in China, Darren, but <laughs> I won't. Um, I'll, I'll just um, read out Benson Chung's um, 
a question which is touching on this also. I mean, he's he's interested in the question of um, the links between terror capitalism in Xinjiang and poverty alleviation campaigns in other frontier regions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, Jennifer, Jennifer Lee's book on poverty alleviation is really useful for understanding this, where she talks about that there's a kind of seepage from you know, social services to state control that poverty alleviation in other parts of the country often focus on, um, you know, petitioners, on former, um, formerly incarcerated, on poor people, on people that have been moved out of their homes to other locations, um, and that there's data collection, there's surveillance that's happening at, at the same time as you know, jobs are being created um, and assigned. Um, so, um, I think that's a, a useful way of thinking about this. The, the work that people like Emily Ye have done in Tibet is also useful to think about how like the gift of development carries with it um, a, a lot of disempowerment because it actually you know, pushes people out of the instit you know, institutional power in those, especially in frontier regions. Um, so, um, you know, that's how I see it working in Xinjiang as well, although it's amplified and accelerated. It's at such a scale that it's really unprecedented anywhere else in the country. Um, because it's working directly in relationship to the camp system, it's producing this status coercion, which means you can be deemed untrustworthy at any point. And so you have no choice but to do what you're told in, in, in terms of working and you, know, you need to keep your head down, you can't protest. Um, you know, there may be some ways you can get, you know, excuses due to illness and family situations at times. Um, but, you know, if the state really wants you to do this work, um, you know, you'll have to give in. And, you know, you see that happening um, in numerous cases. Uh, we have evidence of this happening pretty widely. And it's, and it's in the state documents as well that, you know, refusing poverty alleviation is a sign of extremism. So, you know, conflating terrorism with, you know, not wanting to be assigned a job and separated from your family. Exact. Hmm. Now, um, I can see in the, the Q&A that uh, Guldana is interested in hearing you talk more about your work on masculinity. And I'm very see happy to see that because I'm also interested to hear a bit more about that. You know, Darren, um, I was so struck by your um, your friendship, you know, and your your account of um, Ablimit, uh, this young man in Urumqi, and and just this slow kind of downward spiral that he experienced. You know, as a college educated guy, right, and then just this this. Um, progressive experience of experience of being alienated by racism and then being hounded by the police, unable to hold down a job, you know, because of discrimination, uh, and ultimately, uh, I guess you were arguing that really it was only his friendships that um, stopped him from committing suicide. So I mean that that was an extremely uh, uh, tough read, I thought. Although you you do you know try to find find hope at the end of the narrative. Um, so so I, I was very interested in that kind of relationship that you developed with him, as well as your analysis of masculinity. And if I may um, just loop in a couple more questions around that, that um, uh, question of masculinity and, and your, your relationships in the field. Uh, there, there are a couple of people asking uh, about your, your ethnographic method, when you were in Urumqi, uh, inevitably about whether you're ever going to go back. <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably enough, isn't it? Mm. So. Yeah, um, well, my, my advisor at University of Washington was, is Sasha Suling Welland, who's in, she teaches in the Gender Women Sexuality Program there. Um, and has done her work on, on femininity in China, looking at um, you know, feminist artists. And um, so she pushed me to, to think about gender maybe more than I would have otherwise, um, you know, both at the stage of doing research and in analysis um, that, and, you know, I knew I had to do that because my data set was drawn almost exclusively from men, both Han and Uyghur. Um, and that was a choice I made early on, um, 
it had to do with my own positionality as a you know white male researcher um and also the way i was seeing the policing system was targeting men so directly um it, you know i was welcomed in, welcomed into these friendship networks with young uyghur migrants um pretty easily i had you know all these different networks of friends um people that would call on me almost you know every day you know towards the end so i was like you know from eight to uh you know eight in the morning to eight at night i was like out hanging out with, with young men um you know moving from one group to another meeting them for lunch going on walks um you know hanging out at their jobs all those sorts of things um and what i was really struck with what they taught me really was how they cared for each other how they protected each other how friendship really meant so much to them like that they were jealous in terms of how they protected their friendships um, like if you didn't spend time with them, they would like wonder that think something is up that you're, you know, you're not showing them respect or that you've lost interest in them. Um, and seeing how that they force people that were dealing with depression, which was fairly common in this population to get out of the house, um, to be motivated to try to find work or do something with their lives. Um, that was also really inspiring and just you know made me think about the kinds of protection that they were instilling and, and how they did that by often through storytelling and, and sharing food so you know telling the same stories over and over again about how they had suffered from discrimination um how they had you know stayed strong despite it you know how they you know really uh demonstrated a kind of authorship and agency um through their storytelling because they, they were like the center of the narrative they were reconstructing the world around them um in a way that you know gave them some authority and another thing that i drew from was this book that i, I one of the the young men i was spending time with helped translate with me uh, a novel by per hatursun that will be out later this year called The Back Streets, which is about male migrant life in Urumqi. Um, and so like, reading that text um, and then comparing it and talking about it with these young men really became a way of sort of opening up um, their lives and helping to understand you know, what their desires were, how they were being confronted by the world. Um, so you know, that's why I turned to friendship. And also like Uyghur language is so rich in how friendship is described. Um, it's just such an essential part of life. The John Jigardost sharing the same life and liver with someone, um, you know, that sort of intimacy, the blood brother and soulmate at the same time um, is just so rare to find in the world. You know, I hadn't encountered that kind of depth of friendship before. Um, and so I was really struck with it. In terms of ethnographic method, you know, it's what I just described, hanging out um, and then testing people's, what people are telling me against each other. So, you know, what someone told me about their life, comparing it to what someone else was telling me. Um, and then also moving between ethnic groups, Han and Uyghur, um, to get different perspectives on the same thing, looking at different class positions as well, who's, you know, how people in higher, you know, with a bit more wealth and education think about the same phenomena as someone who doesn't have that. Um, that was all, you know, things that I was thinking about as I was trying to construct the life world of the city. Um, in terms of going back, you know, I was there last in 2018, um, really going through the same neighborhoods to see what had happened to them and just observing so many people missing, talking to people and saying, yeah, that person's gone, doesn't exist anymore, or, you know, it's gone into this non-existence yolk. Um, and you know i was followed at certain points detained at checkpoints found out later that other like another researcher was questioned about me what i had been doing there so you know that made me aware that you know i'm on on some sort of list now i hadn't published much yet but i have a lot you know published a lot since then um i hadn't published much when i was there um, and so, you know, I think, you know, the Global Times says I'm an anti-China figure, um, you know, told the world this. So, you know, at that, at this point, um, the likelihood of me being able to travel and do research in China is, is pretty low. Um, so I'm now shifting to looking at um, populations coming across the border to Kazakhstan and also at, at more global China projects to see how these surveillance systems move to other places. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, 
some of the accounts in in the book of sitting in an apartment say and hearing uh the bell ring downstairs and and this sudden kind of rush of shared paranoia that it might be the police and what was going to happen <laughs> you know those are extremely uh, revelatory about the experience of being a, a young Uyghur man in Urumqi at that time, just desperate. Yeah. Yeah. So Darren, you know, I thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it, it's, it is quite a, a bleak book in many ways. It deals with some really desperate situations, but I really appreciate the way that you find hope, uh, even, or, you know, mechanisms for carrying on and surviving even in the face of, of the extraordinary difficulties the, these people, your friends, face. So I, I really thank you for that. I thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for your questions. Uh, I think we're going to um, send uh, all the questions to Darren, and so uh, he will reflect on them deeply, no doubt. Uh, and if you, you have a burning thing that you, you want to, to put to him directly, please do uh, reach out by email. And I'm to, if, he may find time in his busy schedule to to respond. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here and to meet all of you.